interviewing Mr. Leon Eguia. That's right. For the U.S. Latino and Latina World War II Oral History Project, we are sitting in the Vet Center at Houston, Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Eguia, for letting us interview you. Um, could you tell me, we're going to start off by telling me a little bit, if you could tell me a little bit about what your daily life was like growing up. Growing up, First tell of all, you what, what well, yes, uh, more likely, uh, we came up, or grew up mostly uh, during the Depression, you know, and uh, we were poor and all that, my father didn't have no work, and my brother and I sort of supported the uh, his family by training shoes every day after school and Saturdays. And uh, more than, more likely, uh, okay, here we go again. all right. Well, anyways, uh, that's funny. I want you to keep this in your ear at all times. Okay. Hey, Mr. Ramon, what's your name? Robert uh, Roberto Ramon. Robert Ramon. Okay. Anyways, uh, my father came, you know, from the old country, you know, with the understanding that. Work. He didn't believe in education or, you know, trying. And well, at that time, you know, we were discriminated against, you know, being Mexicans and all that. You know. We couldn't find a job, and they, all he could find was uh, labor jobs, you know, and all that. Anyway, so about 1936, my mother died, and uh, I was about 15 years old then. And, uh, he wanted me to quit school, but I kept going to school and I f finally finished high school. And I got me a job in a clothing store downtown. After school, and, uh, I would get a dollar a day, working uh, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock at night. And uh, on Saturdays from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock, sometimes I had to go there on Sundays to clean up and all that, and didn't even get paid for it. But anyway, when one, I finished high school, uh, I got into tailoring business, you know. Because uh, at that time, you you had to either have a, some kind of a, I don't know, I wouldn't say a, a profession or something like that, but it's some kind of a trade. So that was about the only thing I could get. So I went to Taylor. And when I was, uh, I had to join the union there. And for three weeks, I didn't get paid because I was uh, an apprentice. I was working free. Finally, I did join the, uh, join the union. And I got me a job there downtown. I was there about, let's see, two years when I got drafted. Okay, um, what year were you born? Ma'am? What year were you born? When's your birthday? My birthday? Uh, November 13th, 1921. 20, 1921? 21. And what is your mother and father's name? My father's name was Narciso C. Eguia, E-G-U-I-A. My mother's name was Maria Lara Eguia. And where were you born, here in Houston? I was born in Houston. And how many brothers and sisters do you have? I have one brother. I had four sisters, so I got two alive right now. And you grew up here in Houston and went to school here. What was the elementary school you went to? Ma'am? Your elementary school? Yes, uh, I went to Hawthorne, then I went to Dow Junior, and then I went to Sam Houston High School. I graduated there. And your brothers, your brother and your sisters also went to the same school? Uh, no, no. I uh, only got one sister that graduated. Her name is Tilly. Otila, they call it. 
could you tell me a little bit about your your schooling experience, like going to school? I beg your pardon? Could you tell me a little bit about your schooling experience, like what was it like to go to school? Well, Were you just yes, I understand that. Uh, probably yes and no. I was uh, I wasn't discriminated against, but yet it, you you felt the discrimination. You understand? And in other words, when uh, we were poor, like I say, we were, we were barefooted to school because, you know, we couldn't afford a pair of shoes. The only time we borrowed shoes was on Saturdays or in winter time. And uh, we always took lunch to school, mostly tortillas, you know, and all that. And, uh, and the bolillas used to steal my lunch and leave me those uh, sandwiches, what they call it, the peanut butter sandwiches, you know. <laughs> you know, they used to steal mine, you know, and all that, so. Anyways, but, you know, we, we grew up, we we became friends and you know, all that, but, you know, we had friends and we had two people that were, uh, I'd say that mostly the Mexicanos were more, how we say, uh, more racist to me than the, the, the Anglos. I don't know why. why. Well, I don't know, just the fact that uh, has the way I felt, you know. Maybe because uh, I used to be very active in uh, sports and, you know, and all that, you know. What sports did you play? Well, uh, mostly, you know, sunlight, ball games and all that, you know. But, like softball and a hardball game, that's about it. With the school team? I, I beg your pardon? With the school team? Uh, well, I, didn't, I don't play with the school because I had to work after school, you know, but uh, we used to play, you know, on Sundays and after, on Saturdays, you know, after school, you know, something like that when I had time. We used to get uh, games together and all that, and, you know, just to pass the time away. We didn't have no money to go nowhere, so. So who did you play with? With your Anglo friends? Oh, uh, with friends, you know, the school boys, you know, and all that, you know, friends in the you know neighborhood and all that, you know. So we had a lot of uh, at that time. Most of us uh, were lived in what we call a barrio. See, most of the Mexicanos live in the barrio, and uh, we used to go all the way from uh, six, seven blocks a week. Used to come play with us and vice versa, you know. We, we knew a lot of people, you know, a lot of our boys that way and all that. And uh, when the war came, you know, we lost a lot of friends like that because, uh, you know, and since then, we come back, everybody's scared, you know, going to getting married, go to new neighborhoods and what have you. And uh, sort of lost a lot of track, you know, with a lot of them, but, you know, we still heard about each other, something like that. You know. What did your father do? My father was uh, working on, uh, as a laborer in the uh, Southern Pacific. And your mother? My mother was a housewife. Are you the youngest? A big one. Are you the youngest child in your family? How many? No, are you the youngest? Uh, youngest boy. <laughs> See, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the third. See, my brother, then I had a sister. Then myself, then I had three other sisters. And you say that you were very poor growing up. So did all of your family, your brother and your sisters, did they have to work also to support the family? They all did. Matter of fact, we came down here one, oh, one or time, one time we came down here and uh, I came on furlough. My sister didn't even have shoes on or nothing. I took them out there and bought them uh, coats. Bought them coats because my daddy wouldn't even buy And I used to send home money. I used to get, at that time they were paying $50 a month. Or, but I was a sergeant, so I got, I think, $21 more a month. So it was $71 a month. <laughs> They want to join the parents. Okay. Okay.
Oh man. How did you feel about growing up and being poor? Like did you have friends that had money? Or were most of your uh, friends same level? When I was growing up we we're living day by day or you know, uh, like I say, we didn't know no different. We were born in the barrio and we grew up in the barrios and uh, you know we seen how Anglos, you know, they, they lived a little better because they had better clothes, better food, and what have you, you know, but all that. But we didn't miss it because the fact that uh, we we just improv improvised with everything we could. We used to go out to a junk yard, get some wheels, Axles, go down to the market, get a <laughs> apples. Used to be in a, a crate. Used to be made of, of a wood, you know. So we used to get that and make a make a wagon out of it. And uh, yeah, you know, we improv improvise for ourselves, and we had a lot of fun. In other words, we didn't we didn't miss no no. Uh, I don't think that we missed anything by not having no cars or bicycles or whatever, because we couldn't afford it. I think I think I had a full full life anyway. Thank God, you know. And I and I I'm glad of that. You know why? Because I'm satisfied with what I got. I never wanted to be rich. I never wanted to to have anything else that I didn't need. I didn't try and uh, put on the rich when I know I can't afford it. I'll be out of place if I do. I'm just satisfied with what I am. See, in other words, uh, I live in a neighborhood right now. When I moved in there, it was a nice neighborhood. Now, you know, it's old and all that, but it's still a nice neighborhood. But I see what, what new neighborhoods are now, you know. I says, I don't want to live in those new neighborhoods. So as as they put up there, they put them up in one week. Five years later, you don't have no house. Gotta be repairing those houses, yeah. and not only that, but look at the neighborhoods. Either they, your neighbors never talk to you. Your neighbors never talk to you because they they think they're better than you are, or something, or you know something. Always some kind of prejudice. And to me, that's not life. That's a family. It's not about life. My wife, my kids, my grandkids, my in-laws, whatever, you know. That's, that's, that's my life for me. I don't care for riches, nothing. I'm rich right now. I might not have $20 in my pocket, but I'm rich. You know? And that's, that's, that's my philosophy right now. Satisfied with what I got. Don't, don't, uh, don't live in the past. I don't live in the future, and I don't uh, begrudge nobody. I'm not like a Mexicano. They say, well, look at him. He don't talk to me. He's got money. Huh? Say, say, guy, he's got money. I hope he gets more. That's my philosophy, you know. I never begrudge nobody. I'm, I'm the type of guy that says, say, God, you know, that, like, like I got some, I got four kids. Some of them got good jobs, some don't. And I says, say God, at least they're working. You know? Because they always, and they always come up to me. Daddy, can you, sure, always I can give them a helping hand. Because that's the way I am. So, were you ever resentful to the Anglo community for wanting to segregate? For the discrimination for how they treated Mexicans? I went through that all my life. When I was young, I used to be shiny shoes, some of that. I used to go out there and try and get a barbecue sandwich, some of that. I used to have a sign up there that said, Niggers and Mexicans go around the back. 
Had to go in the back, got that little window in the kitchen out there. You can even drink water out there. Natives Mexicans don't drink, only whites see, in the fountain. And I went through that, even when I was in the fire department, after I came out of service. When I came out of service, I went to see my grandmother in uh, La Corte, Texas. My brother-in-law and I went out there with my sister and my wife. Went out there. No, I wasn't married then. But my, my brother-in-law and my sister was married. Went to Lockhart, see my grandmother there. Went to a, now a hot. I had, still had my uniform on. Went to the drugstore, sat down on the counter. Stayed there about 10 minutes. Finally, I told the young lady, hey, lady, I says, we'd like to get a Coke. I says, I'm sorry to tell you, but we don't serve Mexicans here. I wanted to tear the place up, but I kept my, my, my temper. I just went out of there, went down the road, seen a little old grocery store there, Mexicano, so I said, you got some Cokes here? Yeah, I said. So I said, give me a dozen Cokes. I said, took them over to my grandmother's. So I said, how much owe you for deposit? He said, no, you, you, I'll trust you to bring them back. I said, okay. To this day, I haven't, I've been going back to down there because we, I like to go to Lockhart. Cause they sell good sausages there, see. So. Okay. To this day, I haven't stepped inside that drugstore because of that. And the only place I go to is go to that thing, get barbecue. Because they didn't discriminate against you there. But there's discrimination. Then I went to the fire department. I was discriminated there. They took a, hey, Mexican do this, Mexican do that. Well, I says, hey, thank God, I'm, I'm glad I'm Mexican. I said, at least I know what I am. I said, what the hell are you, 57 Heinz? Got so many varieties of blood in you, you don't even know what the hell you are. I just tell them, you know. Finally, one day I was mad, I was irritated anyway. I was working two jobs at that time, working the police part-time and then fire department. I was frustrated or something, you know, anyway, so I came back. They said, hey, Mexican, you got it? You know, that means if I relieved me. I grabbed by the collar right there and said, look. Hey, Robert, that says, from now on, call me Leon or call me Gia. But don't call me Mexican. So the next time you do that, I said, I'm going to get this shoved down your damn throat. Captain come out there and said, Captain, come here. I want you to hear this. I don't want nobody to call me Mexican. Or, again, call me either Leon or, or Gia. I don't care what you call me. I'm human being just like you are, and I got a name just like you are. I said, hell, I'm, no, I'm Mexican, I'm glad of it. I said, but I got a name, and let's, I'll call everybody by name here. I said, I want y'all to call me by my name. So, I put a stop to that. From then on, they started calling me Leon. And I got more respect out of it, too, because of the fact that I stood up for them. So, I would, when I went in there, you heard about farming, cooking there and all that. They used to cook dinner. They wouldn't even invite me. My, I lived about three blocks away. I used to call my wife, says, you know, after everybody eat and all that, I call my wife up. So, if you have time, can you bring me a sandwich? Or she used to bring me some lunch. Because they, they, they wouldn't even invite me to lunch. Sometimes we eat, you know, we used to work five days during the day. Then we shift over at night times, five nights, see. And, uh, well, a lot of times, you know, come from police, go out there, change my clothes, you know, take a shower and change my clothes and work at night. They cook and everything. By six o'clock, I call my wife, say, bring you something to eat. Say, say, what happened? I said, you know, right there and eat? Nope. Okay, she used to bring my lunch. Yeah. But I was discriminated against, you know. 
But I took it all in stride. I didn't let it get under my skin. To this day, you know, says, you might find little, you know, little discrimination, but I don't care. Because I don't, I just, I'm just like a duck. I let, let it come off my back, see. I don't, I don't let it penetrate me. Why do, how, why do you think this attitude towards Mexican originated? Why didn't they like Mexican? Well, tell you the truth, to this day, you still find a lot of people fighting the Texas Mexican War. Matter of fact, it, when was it yesterday, the Texas Independence Day? They had a big deal going on at the battlefield, uh, that in the uh, St. Jacinto Battleground over here, see. But you didn't hear too much of it because it was raining. But they do, they still doing it, you know? People still fighting the, the war like that. And they discriminate you because of that fact. In other words, they conquered the uh, Mexicans. Uh, they still want them. Keep on under the thumb, see. And she right there. No, I couldn't do that one. Not there. I didn't bring it. 1953. I joined the. I was the. Uh, joined the Lulex. I was the president of Lulex. 1953. Lulex number 60. Council 60. We were fighting. The city, the county, on discrimination because they wouldn't hire no Latinos in the fire department, in the police department, and all that. Finally, we we were uh, instrumental in getting the city and the county together, and we forced them. We say we forced them because we 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 had a. At that time, we had an activist. Uh, he was a how you call it. He was a writer for the Houston Press. At that time, he was a very active. His name was Andy Anderson, and he uh, helped us a lot because of the fact that he liked Mexicanos and he he liked the poor people too. And uh, he made a big stink out of it in the Houston Press, where they brought the all the city and the county heads and all that together and the county courthouse on Fenton Street. That's where we used to hold our meetings. We went out there and told them that how come they didn't hire Mexicans? They said they were all too short. They didn't even have no uh, high school education, nothing. We asked them, what are the qualifications? So you gotta buy five, 10, weigh 165 pounds, be a high school graduate. So one of our uh, activists, his name was uh, Reverend Navarro, got up there, he says, all those that meet this qualification stand up. About 50 of them stand up there. Please to Police chief didn't say nothing. He said, well, okay. He said, tomorrow, we had to the city hall to the ninth floor. I think uh, they hired up a ninth, uh, 39 of um, them. 39 of them went out there and they, they hired all uh, Americanos. Two years later, I joined the fire department. See, I was number eight. Yes, is everybody is right there. Eight. See, it was 1956 when I joined the fire department. But that's uh, that's how we fought the discrimination. We're not like the colored people, you know, putting pressure or, or hollering discrimination or racist or this or that. We don't. We did it through how you call it through, through education. We encourage everybody who came out of the service to try and get an education. And like me, I couldn't go to get an education. My, my father didn't believe it. He believed in going to work. Like a, like a slave driver, you know, and all that. He didn't believe in that. 
but that's the way it was. And uh, well, when when I went to service, it was different though. Okay. I've got because uh, because the fact that uh, when I became a uh, when I went here from here, we went to Fort Sam Houston. From Fort Sam Houston, sent me over to uh, Camp Roberts, uh, California. And most of the people there, they were from New York and New Jersey. So they didn't know what Americanos were. As a matter of fact, I told them, oh, you were from Texas. And they're not like, like now that everybody's knowledgeable, you know, with the TV and all that. They asked me if I, if I had cattle and oil here. You know, they thought every, everybody in for Texas had a cattle and oil well, see. That's how, you know, it's how ignorant people were at that time. So I wasn't discriminated. Matter of fact, the first day I was there, they put me as an acting corporal. And from then on, I never was in the wrecks. I was always in the big, big sergeant and corporal and all that, but you know, but uh, I never was in the wrecks. Because of the fact that, you know, I might call it a common sense or good luck, or I don't know, <laughs> you know, but anyway, so. Um, and I, I never was discriminated though. Because that. Service. Um, I want to go back to before we go into your war years. You were raised Catholic. Who? You were raised with the Catholic religion. Yes. And uh, so you followed. Were your parents big on religion? I tell you what, I wasn't too uh, too keen on religions. See, like I said, uh, my father was a. Uh, a Mason. He turned to be a Mason anyway. And he became a big chad, uh, one of the big masters of Mason. Anyway, so he didn't encourage us to go to church or nothing like that. Until I became uh, engaged and I started, uh, my wife started pushing me, you know, going back to becoming a Catholic. And then, since then, In 1963, I joined the Knight of Columbus, but being uh, working on two jobs, I couldn't make it. So I quit. Then in 1983, they started a new council there in, the, in our church. And uh, I became the first Grand Knight right there. I'm a charter member there. And uh, then after that, I, uh, I joined the fourth degree in the Knight of Columbus too, and a year later became a navigator, which was just like a president of the organization. So I've been, I'm a passenger of Grand Knight, a, a past navigator too, so I've been active in both of them lately, you know, I still am. And uh, the thing is that the You believe in the one thing, you follow things that you believe in, like I believe in that because of charity. I believe in charity because of the fact that uh, helping other people, uh, you know, give them scholarships or like we got a, a state program helping the deaf. You know, the people, the deaf people are, say, say you might get married, you have a deaf child or something like that, by maybe got some disease or something like that. Well, how is that child gonna communicate with you and you with them, see? So you gotta educate both of them, see? We gotta teach you Braille and teach it for Braille also, you know, how to sign language, what you, see? Both of them have to learn the language, see? And that's what I like about it, because the fact that you're not teaching just one person, you're teaching the family, yeah. and that—that's that, that's, uh, one of our biggest programs right there. Not like that, something like that. See, and then we give scholarships out. We gave uh, eight scholarships out last uh, what was it, last August, 
With what organization is this with LULAC? A big pardon? With what organization is this? This is Night Clubs. Night Clubs. Okay. And the, uh, we gave, and matter of fact, they have a chili cook off today, which is uh, to raise funds for, for, for scholarships. See? I'm supposed to be over there, but, you know, this is, a, well, I figure this is important one, too, so. You know, like they say, you have to pick your priorities, you know. They just like in church right now. I joined the, far, uh, the, the Night of Columbus there. I started the Night of Columbus there in church. About a year later, the priest called, called me, wanted me to minister, you know, a Eucharist minister. I've been a minister ever since then. And uh, I'll help the church, you know, in several projects and all that, you know, but I'm always, uh, you know, they asked me to go out there and help count money, you know, during, once a month, you know, go out there, you know, the collection from Sundays. So I'll go out there and collect. So, I mean, that's something you want to do, you know. Like I said, I've been retired a long time, so I've got to do something besides just laying around doing nothing. Um, growing up, what traditions did you all practice, like um, Mexican traditions, the culture? How were you raised up? Like, you know, quinceañeras, uh, bautismos, or how? Uh, well, to tell you the truth, uh, like I say, we weren't brought up family-wise, you know, for all that. I wasn't uh, invited to be a padrino or or uh, or something like that, anything, until after we got married. You understand? And I think uh, we baptized four children. That's about it. I mean, besides ours, you know. And uh, standing at weddings and all that, I never do go for that. I don't. I tell my wife, I don't like quinceañeras. I don't like weddings. I don't like. Uh, uh, part like that. I don't mind baptisms, you know, but, you know, that's it, you know, that, uh, I, I'm not a, how you call it, I'm not a person that, uh, what do you call it, party uh, goer, or what do we call it? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, You're, not I, I gotta, yeah? You're not into parties. No, no, I'm not. I'm not a. A big fan of party. No, well, I'm just, I'm just a plain old guy. That's all. You know. I don't mind going, you know, and all that and all that, but, uh, but I, I'm not. I'm looking out for parties and all that. I do like to travel. I love to travel, and I like to, to go here and there, and even if I go out of town. But you know, I like to travel. When I retired from the fire department, I told my wife I got to send her to take her to Europe. I did. We went there for three weeks. We went all the way. Went to England, Italy, Germany, Switzerland, Spain. I don't know what else. We went all over there for three weeks. We had to be a wonderful time. Was that the first then, time she had gone? I beg your pardon? Was that the first time she had gone to Europe? Yeah. Was it your first time? Uh, well, she uh, retired from the fire department and I uh, had a, a lot of vacation time and sick time. In 20 years, I only used 10 days of sick time. So I had to uh, two, nine, 290 days, so they paid me all that. Thing, so we used to go there to Europe. So that's just, and then uh, 1984. Uh, went down to Hawaii. We've been to Mexico, I don't know how many times. And we, we just travel all over, you know. I've I got a boy that lives out there in Phoenix. We've been going out there about 12 years now. So, so you know, we, we, we don't, like my wife says, as long as we're we can make it, let, let's get out of here, let, 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 you know, don't worry, but Bill's going to be here anyway. You can, you can close this 
throw down for the month, even if you're not here the whole month, you're going to have bills right here, right? It's the same way with the house. You gotta have a bill there whether you live there or not. So might as well go enjoy yourself. Yeah. And that's our philosophy. We don't have no money, but we take off with heck with it. You know, it's, it's like I say, you know, people I think I'm crazy or something, but I, I don't know. Just like I say, I'm not a party hound or nothing like that, but I enjoy myself, thank God. As you were growing up, was there something going on in, in the country, in the community, that um, shaped your life in any way? Like a historical event that you recall? That Not necessarily. No? no, because the fact that uh, when you say community, I, I consider that uh, neighborhood, the church, and all that thing. And uh, usually, the church is just just like everything, you know, everything. It changes. They change priests, they change uh, schedules, uh, not schedules, but methods of uh, programs or whatever, you know, all that thing. So, so you just go, go along with it, you know. It don't, it don't, it don't affect me too much, in fact. Uh, and uh, as far as politics, I don't go for that. I don't. I don't care for politics. I never have. It. And and I like to see Latinos get in there. Yes. And, but I don't. I don't. I don't go out there. Out of my way to you know to promote them or nothing like that. So. Is your first language Spanish? A big one. Your first language is it Spanish? Yes. Do your parents speak? Um, it's, as a matter of fact, when we were little, I remember my father used to have some books, uh, poems in Spanish. He used to give us a lesson, uh, a, I say, he used to give us a, a poetry, you might say, that we had to learn by the time he got home from school, uh, from church, from uh, for work. In the mornings, we had to sit down, you know. We didn't go to school. We knew how to read. We knew how to write. We knew our pontification tables and everything in Spanish by the time we went to school. Everything in Spanish. Matter of fact, I didn't know my name in English when I went to school. I translated everything. And, uh, but we learned English, Spanish from the beginning. Everything was in Spanish. My wife, uh, my mother never, didn't know too much English. My daddy didn't either, I mean, you know. Tried not to get by, you know, get a job or something like that. But, but as far as we're concerned, uh, we learned it all, all ourselves right there going to school. And as far as the, like you say, education, well, it depends on us, on the person themselves. I got my youngest sister, and the one that follows her, were very smart. You know, I say intelligent, I don't say smart, you know, intelligent. My brother's very intelligent. That was one of my other two sisters and myself. <laughs> no kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm just one of those uh, lucky guys who get by, how you call it, camouflage everything. <laughs> I think I think we did. As far as uh, myself, as far as myself, I think I think uh, I don't say uh, I grade myself about eight out of ten. Why do you say that you and your sisters were the dumbest? A big pardon? Why do you say that you and your sisters were the dumbest? You and your other two sisters. 
Did I am. school or? I tell you what, uh, I talked to, I got in-laws, you know. I'm talking about the daughter-in-laws, son-in-laws, and what have you, and all that. I talk to them, and all they say, they think I'm intelligent. I'm not, I don't think so, you know. I, I like to read and all that, see, but uh, I don't say that I'm intelligent enough to, to be a college graduate or nothing like that. I'm just uh, average, you might call it. And uh, the only thing that helped me is, I think it's got a little good common sense, that's all. I have more good common sense than, than I do education. I don't know. Because they always come in, you know, especially my, got a couple of daughter-in-laws that come up to, to always ask me for, you know, advice and all that and always stuff. And they always come up there. Matter of fact, one of them told my wife, said, I like to talk to Mr. Gia. He always got good common sense and all that. Because of that, you know. They think I do, but I don't. I'm just, I'm just a, like I say, uh, I'm an average person, that's all. But you did finish um, high school. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. you, oh, you were 18 when you finished high school? Huh? You were 18 years old? 17. 17. At that time, they went to 11th grade only. Up to 11th grade? Yeah, at that time, yeah. Oh. That's like I was graduated with 17th. Was that three years of high school? Yeah, yeah, at the oh. 11th grade to 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And you graduated at 17, and then you went to work at the tailor business for two years? Yeah. What did you do there? Tailors, alterations. What was the name of that? Raleigh, Jude, and Beck. R O L L E. Joy. J E W E T T and Beck, B E C K. It's closed the store downtown. It's still. Huh? It's still open. He knocked all that down at down the main street there. And then you were drafted to the service, or you volunteered? They, they drafted me. How was that like? Could you tell me a little bit of what you were doing? Well, I tell you. I wanted to join. At that time, they, they uh, sank the USS Houston, and uh, I tried to volunteer, and uh, they wouldn't accept me because my, my father had to sign for it. I was only 18 at that time, and he uh, he wouldn't sign for it. So I keep uh, went into tailoring business, and then I. When I got drafted, you know, that's it. It just took off. What year was that when you got drafted? Ma'am? What year was it? 1942. And I went there in, uh, in 1943, I think it was. Uh, I went to the paratroops. What military service did you join? A big one. What military service? It was the combat engineers. But what, I mean, what is it? Is it the Army? The Army. Army combat engineers. Uh -huh. Army combat engineers. And after I joined the paratroops, it still it was known as the Airborne Combat Engineers. And where did you go for training or? Well, I went there to uh, Georgia for training for uh, six weeks. Georgia? Georgia. Camp Bennington. Georgia and, uh, for parachute training for six weeks. And when I graduated from there, yeah, I went to North Carolina, joined a a division, they call it 13th 
is airborne division. And then uh, we were attached to the 82nd Airborne. And uh, we just went all the way through the, to the war, you know, just, you know, attached to them, although we were just a division. And uh, we... Uh, How long were you in North Carolina? North Carolina? Uh, about six months. And what did you do there? Was that another uh, training, training? Training. Then we went down to uh, North Carolina, then we went to Tennessee. We stayed another six months, I think. And what was that also training? Or? Training also, you know, and then uh, from there we went to uh, Boston to ship over. What year was that? Was that still? Huh? Was that still? For, no, what year was that? Forty. Forty-three. Forty-three. Let's see. No, it was forty-four. 44. Nineteen forty-four. Cause uh, yeah. Cause then we went to uh, England from there, and from England we went out there to uh, we flew to uh, Lyons, Lyons. France, and therefore there we truck into the Battle of the Bulge, or to Bastogne. Be the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. in Bastogne on December 24th, 1944. That was my baptism for the. <laughs> and, uh, Could you tell me what training was like? A big one. How was training like? Training. Your training experience. I liked it. Liked it. Yeah, it's a you know, it's a. Well, it was a little rougher than regular uh, training. You know, when you go in, uh, it's it's a rookie. You know, but uh, mostly physical. Basically, and then uh, the, especially the parachutes, you learn how to uh, how to fold your own parachutes, and you have to jump with them. So you better pay attention to what you're doing. <laughs> and uh, were you scared? Huh? Were you scared the first time? Y y your mind is so blank. Yeah, you don't think about it. You know. I remember one time we were sitting around. The campfire right there the night before we jumped, you know. There was a guy there, you know, and he was an instructor. He was a cap uh, couple and he says to he said, Hey cop. He says, How come uh, what is it you about jumping out there? He said, I, I, to tell you the truth, I never even been in an airplane. And then I gotta go tomorrow and jump out or I said, I really did, you know, I've been falling with parachutes and everything, you know. He says, just remember one thing. See the guy in front of you? If he can do it, you can do it. Just keep that in your mind. He's no better than you are. I'm going to tell you another thing. He said, I've never seen a Latin American come through here that, that, that failed to jump out. Seen the other ones, you know. They're shaking out and all that. He said, but I haven't seen my cut yet. And that that really encouraged me. So I said, heck, if that guy can do it, I can do it too, you know. And that that's a how you call it a, a shot adrenaline, you might call it. Because the fact that, you know, it's uh encouraged you a lot. But then, uh, after we made the jumps and everything, and uh, especially the first one you come down there, you get up there, start looking up there, here comes the sergeant. Get your gut your butt out of here, get that to <laughs> Everybody jumping out there, you're looking up there. <laughs> it's beautiful, I'll tell you, I just loved it. Yeah. 
it's a beautiful feeling, you know. What yeah, you think you think you, you know you you just carried up there first, you know. Then when the thing pops up, you look at them and you look at the landscape up there, beautiful. They're like squares up there, you know, the, the landscapes that are beautiful. And uh, you come down in a 45 degree angle like that, uh, just tell it float in the air, it's all uh, wonderful. One time we were, we were out there in North Carolina at night time. There was a guy named uh, Smith, called Yardbird Smith, because he was a hillbilly, you know. So, and you know, he said, Lieutenant Kamate, he says, See, uh, Gia, see. He, he, yes, yeah, Sergeant, he's supposed to jump, you know, right in back of me, he said, but put Smith in front of you. He said, Because, you know, you're going to freeze. Well, when you freeze, that's when you stand and don't, don't intrude up. See. I said, okay. So he gets up there, he froze, you know. So I grew like that. I jumped about, you know, first of all with my hand out there. When I did that, I, I went head first, went out there. Uh, finally, the chute opened, you know, but the trod lines were under my, my emergency chute. And I was coming down pretty fast, you know. So I get my bird shoot out, you know, open it up, and it pops open, and uh, landing on some trees out there. I'm about 20, 30 feet off the ground. <laughs> Nighttime, raining. So I heard a guy out there say, and I called him out. Uh, what the hell was his name? Anyway, so I say, hey, Aaron. His name was Aaron. Hey, Aaron. Yeah, there's a gear. Where you at? I say, I'm up here in the trees. <laughs> He's looking at the, say, oh, we gotta let you hang out there. Pretty soon about three, four of the guys coming. They just look at it and run and just laughing. Like, Come on, throw me something, throw me a rope or something, you know. <laughs> you know <laughs> well, finally, you know, they threw me a rope and then I got my knife, you know, slid down. But they, they just had a good time. You know. It's real nice, you know. Real comradeship, that's what it is, you know. This is, a, this is a, how you call it? You're looking out for each other, yet, you know, you, you have a, how you call it? Have fun with each other, too, you know. They don't care whether you're a sergeant, whether you're a private or what, see. Even lieutenants, we used to kid with them and all that, because we're, we're more of a comradeship, see. We're not a... We want to, uh, how you call it, uh, too stuck up like you do in the army, you know, they say, a sergeant says, hey, 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 you know, I want a sergeant, I never, never holler at nobody. I told them to do it, they did it, see? Why? Because you treat them like a human being. What they say, you treat somebody with the honey, you get more, more grab out of them than, you know, treat with the vinegar, see? That's what I used to do. Treat like a human being, just like I want them to treat me, and, I, and that's, and I didn't have no, 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 no enemies. I didn't have no enemies for separation. We can't chip, that's all. We have all years, we had the, matter of fact, I was only Mexicano there. I was only Mexicano, and the, the, only, the nearest one that was, he was from Texas. He was from Fort Worth. He was a he was a, a cook. I don't even remember his name, to tell you the truth. You used to call him Red. He was a sergeant and the cook. He used to call me over. He said, hey, Gil, yeah. uh -huh. come on over. He used to come at nighttime. He'd stay there and make pastry, you know, and have a cup of big old cup of coffee then come on get some coffee and all that all. if I be on guard say here you yeah, go here's some coffee and pastry there for this, you know I'll go get my guard come on let's go get some coffee you know they used to fight to be on guard with me you know so they, they knew I, I was always you know me and the sergeant always had it in good with 
a lot of times they know, what you gonna have to be needing? Oh, I don't like that trip. Come back at the wall, you know. Go back out there, he made me a big old steak or something, you know. You know, we always, comrade trip, that's all there was. You know, people, people don't, you know, they see the army one way, you know, but that's, that's not the way it was. The, 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 the thing is, uh, my kids asked me, what you gonna do? Hey, what you see in the, in, the, in the movies, you know, I'm not gonna tell you what happened, you know. I tell my wife, I tell my kids. I said, a lot of times, you, I'm the type of guy that they don't say, I love you. I'm not the type of the guy that says, oh honey this, honey that. I said, no, why? I'm gonna tell you why. When I was in service, I was seeing a lot of stuff. So what I did, put a, I built a wall in me, between me and that, my, my feelings. Otherwise I'd have gone crazy, like a lot of people did. And that's the way I've been ever since. I don't, I don't go out there. My kids come and say, love you daddy, fine, thank you. I don't tell them. Because I'm that type. I just, uh, I had to do something to survive, I think. And that's what I did. That's where we left off, France and the Battle of the Bulge. Do you want to continue from there? The what? Um, when I went to England? How long were you there? What did you do there? Well, I was in England there in the... We used to... I don't remember even the place where I was. Anyways, we used to go to London over the weekend. You can see nothing, everything was black hat. All you could hear was three bombs going over there. You could see them out there, those bombs, you know, three bombs they used to call, coming across from uh, there and exploding all over, you know. And uh, one thing about it, you know, the, the morale of the English people were very high there at that time. And especially when they see the, the American soldiers there. You know. And uh, we were there in the, well, let's say about, let's say we were not there, but we were right there in October, November. Yeah, in December we went down to France. So. And uh, once I got in the front line, you know, that's, I was here there, and then I was there about, oh, see, no, about three, four weeks, I think, something like that. We were out there in the, nothing but snow. In France? Snow. It's no one think that high. <laughs> Couldn't even dig a fight hole or so. Just like digging a fight hole in a cement. You know. And this was in France? Huh? The snow was in France? It was known at that time. Were? Yeah, in, uh, in uh, Belgium. In the Battle of the Bulge. Anyway, so I, I caught pneumonia over there. Went back to France, stayed there a couple of weeks, we came back. And then uh, joined my outfit. Then we jumped the Rhine River. Went across the Rhine River there. That's the last phase of the, of the uh, war, you know. We went through the Ruhr Valley right through there, the 
the Ruhr Valley is where the, uh, all the industrial plants were and all that, you know, then. And uh, we went through there, and uh, most of them were in Nansen. Everything was flattened out, man. I tell you, the bombers really did a good job in there. And we had to go out there and uh, blow up those uh, tank emplacements. A big old block like this right here, you know, made out of concrete. So we had to go blow them up at their nighttime. Germans were sending those 88s over right, right to us, you know. And here we were working out there. We didn't care. We were working. And uh, what happened to him? Had this guy had a He had a, uh, I don't know, piece of pipe like that, you know, like that. Went like that, you know, at night time, you know, I had my hand like that, and uh, he went up there, boom, get it right on my thumb, see. So I told him, don't, you know, and all that. So, anyways, we stayed there until about 4 o'clock in the morning, come back. I went to meet to the uh, medic. Hey, he, took, he wrapped it up. He said, I'm going to give you a Purple Heart. I said, no, man. I said, yeah. Give me a Purple Heart. He never wrote it out on it. So it's not on my record. Anyway, so the, uh, he gave me five points to come home anyway for Christmas. We were right there in the Camp Chesterfield in France, ready to go to Europe, I mean to uh, Pacific. When they, uh, they declared the uh, war over in Pacific. Okay? So we came over to, to the United States. So they were not got their charge. What, 1945? 1945, August 19th. 1945. Um, you said you had five points to come home for Christmas? Huh? You said you were given five points and... Five more points. They give you points for uh, for being in service, how many years you got in service, how many times you've been on, uh, overseas, and for medal, you know. So they gave me five points just enough to come home for Christmas, so... What medals did you... A big one? What medals did you receive? For your service. Just that. Yeah, well, I got, you know, the European Medal of Victory Medal and the uh, Good Conduct Medal and blah, blah, and all that. I don't know. I don't count them. I don't, like I say, my wife or my father never took care of nothing, so I don't have nothing to show for them. Could you tell me a bit more about your experience in the Battle of the Bulge? Well, I tell you, the, the main thing was that the, we went in there and uh, we didn't know what to expect, didn't hear nothing, just told us, you know, go out there and hold the line, the Germans were coming through. And we were there and uh, they had uh, tanks coming through and uh, some airplanes you come down there and strafing us and all that. And that's about it, you know. And we just kept going up and going for hedgerows to hedgerows, you know, and all that. And uh, then uh, we were out there one night and then uh, Lieutenant come out there and says, yeah, he says, uh, our password for tonight, you know, we're supposed to change word every about five o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. So go tell your, your squad, you know, that the password. So I go out there, you know. And I'm bending over, a guy, he's in a foxhole like this, and I tell him, name of Roe, O O W E. And I said, look, Roe, how you doing? All right, blah, 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 and all that, you know. I tell him it was a password, uh, you know, for tonight and all that, you know. 
hit the ADH coming over there and hitting the pine trees and stuff. Pretty soon, I was like this, and his head was like this. Right, in, you know, I was close to mine like that, we were talking like that. When boom, hmm, hit him right there in the back. Yeah. Piece of a treadmill, hit him in the back. He said, Honestly, I think I'm hit. I said, So I jumped in there, you know, and hit a, a overcoat and everything. So it hurt, yeah, okay. So I went and got a medic in, took him out there and had a piece of treadmill on his back. It missed me by that much from my neck. Where I was bending over like that, just passed like this right here, where he hit him. The medic says, man, another four inches to the right, he said, he had to hit you right on the neck. <laughs> That's how close I came to getting hit at the time. Were you afraid to die? Hmm? Were you afraid to die? The what? Were you afraid of death, of dying? Now, you know, you get so frustrated out there, you want to get, you want to get the wounded or something, so you can go down and lay in a hospital somewhere where it's warm. You know, it's a cold, you know. So cold and everything, I'm telling you, it's uh, just frustrating. You know, a lot of people don't, you know, they they say uh, they're afraid and all that. You don't think about those things. I mean, it, it, I didn't. Hey, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? You know, it, it might affect you a lot of times. You wanted to get get wounded so you can go out there where it's warm, you know. Was that the first time you had seen snow? Huh? Was the the that the first time you had seen snow? The day that you got the, the snow, snow? Yeah, oh, it's that snow. was the first time you'd seen snow. No, that wasn't the first time I seen snow. But you know, I'd seen uh, not that much. You know, where where. You spend about three or four weeks outside, you know, with no no shelter, nothing, no no warmth, no nothing. Eating hay rations and well, whatever, you know. But you don't feel it. I mean, uh, you you uh, you just take it in stride. That's all. When you're young like that, uh, uh, you know, you never think about certain things, you know, about certain, uh, where you wanted to, you know, uh, like you see that their mom and dad, I, I never did that. I lost my mom when I was 15. My dad didn't get there in the so, you know, I didn't have no family actually, yeah, so. To me, I was more like a, an orphan, you might say, you know. So with, with no family, nothing. What did your mother die of? She had a intestinal fever. And your father? He died of a cirrhosis of the liver. And, and you said this was while you were in service? Huh? When your father passed away? No, no, he passed away when, after I came back. He was 76 years old. When he passed away, he was already married and everything. Did he remarry? Huh? Did he remarry? No, he never remarried, no. What is the, um, the, worst, experience, the worst experience that you have with the war? Or the worst memory? That the have? worst? I tell you what, uh, we were uh, we we're supposed to jump over the Rhine River, and they told us uh, we were supposed to be attached with the English, and we went over, uh, across there in helicopters, uh, not not helicopters, so. Uh, Gliders, rather. Gliders. Well, we flew the gliders one time, you know, just training. And this time we, we went out there and one thing about a glider, you know, it's don't have no motor, nothing. You go down, 
you can't bring it up no more, you know, just go, if you go hit a tree, you're going to hit. See. And I seen a lot of those uh, gliders hit out there, a lot of people die. I seen one that uh, caught on fire. See that rear shoulder right there, just like a piece of charcoal on his hands and knees like that. He also all burned up. And uh, then uh, further down, we well, were going out there, we seen a German soldier, I think it was, must have been uh, killed or something, uh, crossing the road there. A tank came out there and ran, ran over his head and all that, uh, you know, stuff like that, you know. Uh, that's, uh, you know, experience like that that, you know, gets you. But at that time you weren't thinking about You're young, you don't care, you know. You just keep going, that's all. Um, you see your buddies, you know, going out there running all of a sudden, dead duck, you know what I'm saying? Were you still, what did you say your division was? You said there? I beg your pardon? You said you were in the 13th Air Division? The what? The, your division. Division 15, 13th. 13th, that's yeah. what you were in with yeah. your service. And were you the only, um, you said you were the only Mexican in training? I don't want. You, you said you were the only Mexican um, in that division during training? During training? Mm -hmm. No, see, I went to train in the Fort Bend in Georgia. See, and then I went to join that division. And were you the only Mexican or, or were there other Mexicans? Uh, I was the only one. Uh, I mean, uh, during training there were some other ones, you know. There were some guys from uh, L.A. And all that, see. Then uh, when I went over there to uh, division, I was the only one in my company. So I was the only Mexican in my company there. What was the company? Huh? That co it's company? Uh-huh. 307th uh, Airborne Combat Engineers. It's 307? Mm-hmm. How did you become a, a sergeant? Huh? You said you were a sergeant? A sergeant. How did you become a sergeant? Buck sergeant, yeah, see, uh, what happened uh, when I went to the boot camp, first day, uh, you know, they were marching and the sergeant called me over. He said, you had it, he, you got coordination, you know, you have, have it all to see, you train or anything? He said, no, sir. He said, so, they're gonna make a assistant corporal, you know, acting corporal. So I was acting corporal there, and uh, after training, I went to a, to a combat engineer in the Mojave Desert, and I was uh, I made a acting sergeant there. And then uh, I went to uh, Oregon, and I went to, uh, they had a, what they call a cattery, building new companies. And uh, I went there as a regular corporal. In other words, you know, they made me a regular corporal. I wasn't acting no more. A month later, they made me a sergeant. And this is while you're training, right? No, after I was training, you know, right after training, yeah. Right after training. See, so you train for six months, see. Then I went to the regular company. In other words, from training you go to a company. We went to the company, and I was acting there. And then I went to another company where they making regular company, and they made me a regular corporal and a sergeant there, see. And, uh, and I was there, but when they uh, had a, uh, they were recruiting for airborne. So me and the 
four other guys joined the airborne there. And out of four of them, I'm the only one that made it. The river, two of them quit and the other one broke a leg, so. I don't know what you know. But uh, anyways, I'm the only one that made it the uh, whole company. Anyways, uh, when I went to the airborne, you know, that was uh, way different because of the fact that the training is different and uh, they used to get you up in the morning and you know, run five, ten miles an hour, uh, you know, before breakfast. Then after breakfast you exercise for about an hour, then you go to into field training and all that. See? And they did a lot of, uh, lot of uh, activities, in other words, you know. And, and the funny part about it, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the lieutenants and the captains, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. the officers there, they wanted to, they want to, uh, how you call it, gung hoes or nothing like that, like the, you know, like you see in the movies, you know, and they were just, Regular people like you, you know, you know they, they want to be buddy buddies too. They, you know, because the fact that no, you're gonna depend on them. They're gonna depend on you when you get out of there. So that, that's about it, you know. But you know, you know, you know, you that's a lot of things. But comradeship, you know, in the, in the army that you don't see in the, you know, and you don't hear that crying and whining and all that in the, in the army. I didn't, I didn't hear. It. You know, like you do in the army, the, the movies, you know, have bull corn. You know, it's a, how you call it, it's a tearjerker, so that's all they are, see. Either, either you, you're in or you're out, or one or two. So you get along with all of them anyway? I try, I mean, it's all you go with there. I remember out there in the Oregon, we were out there in the, I'm sorry, when did you go to Oregon? Because you had told me that you were in Georgia. Huh? You, t you had told me that you were in Georgia for six weeks. Yeah. And then you went to North Carolina for six months. Yeah. And then, and then from there you went to Oregon? Or where did you go? When did you go to Oregon? Uh, I went right after the... Uh, before I went to our paratroops. That's when I went to... First of all, I went from Fort Sam Houston I went to uh, Camp Roberts, and where I took my training. From Camp Roberts, I went to Mojave Desert. Mojave Desert, I went to Oregon, Camp White. And then, from there, I went to the paratroops. When you say you went to paratroopers, that was when you were sent to? I, I, went, to, I went to Georgia, yeah. And then from Georgia, North Carolina? Mm-hmm. Okay. North Carolina, then Tennessee, and... And then England? Mm-hmm. And you were discharged in the Pacific? No, right here in the United States. In uh, Fort Dix, uh, New Jersey. While you were in service, um, you only spoke English, or did you practice Spanish well? Nothing but English. But the only time I spoke Spanish was I was in Berlin and got a furlough to Switzerland. We were in uh, Bern, Switzerland. We are in. We have got a few little drinks, you know, on the, that Saturday night or something, you know. Next morning, we get up, we get, 
hangover, you know. We were walking around, uh, seeing the fellows there and asking, you know, where we could uh, get some coffee or anything, you know. To, he told me, he said, look, told me to go down here, go to Nelly, and there was a red line. Had a big line out there. You know. So he called the red line. He said, lock on the door. He said, he's a Spanish guy. Tell him, you know, you want some breakfast? Okay. We're not there. That guy must have been about six, six. Bald headed, just like Mr. Clean, you know. <laughs> and I talked Spanish to him. I said, uh, you talk Spanish? Oh, you talk Spanish? You see, come on, pásale, pásale. Y cómo está ahí? Muy bien. Le voy a decir la verdad. Somos aquí soldados, andamos en vacaciones y andamos crudos para decir la verdad. Ah, oh, pásale, pásale. He called his wife over there. And tell her to bring some breakfast somewhere. He gets some... Uh, tomato juice and bring it over, you know, kids and all that. We were talking like that in Spanish and all that. And he was real nice, you know, because of the fact that talking Spanish, you know, nobody talked Spanish to him and blah, blah, and all that. And me being a, from the United States, you know, being a, being a American soldier and all that, so he was real glad, you know. Anyway, we were talking like that and pretty soon he said, uh, Told his wife, you know, bring the breakfast over. Two eggs, big old steak like that, and that brown bread, you know, what they call the black bread, you know, and all that. And black coffee and all that. And I tell you, hit the spot. We stay there just talking. After we get there, he gets some wine, start drinking. <laughs> we didn't feel it afterwards, you know. We stay there. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, on Sunday morning. We left there about 7 o'clock that night. He done fed us again and all that, you know. Oh, man, we had a good time and all that. Told me, hey, we'll never go out there. I went to look for him when my wife and I went out there to uh, vacation out there. I went to look for him. I couldn't find him, you know, red line. I asked for her, you know, and all that. You know, nobody knew about it, you know. You know, after 50 years, you, you know, you can't. You know, forty some odd years. You know, you you forget just where it was and all that. And uh, well, anyway, so uh, I tried to look for him. We couldn't find him. That man was Mexican. He was Spanish. He was Spanish, yeah. Anyways, uh, we were talking. He says, uh, "No, they had a they had a German colony, English colony, Spanish colony, and an Italian colony in there." in the town, you know. And he says, because uh, I asked him, he says, uh, let him speak Spanish. He said, no, it's, it's a very little, very few could be, you know, that colony, you know, right there. And Europe is not like the United States. It's not spread out. Everything close by. Say, say you want to go from uh, France to, to Germany, it's just like going from here to, to Dallas. You know, it's how close it is, you know, just like that. And not like going all the way down to, to California. Yeah. I mean, real close and everything. So every, you know, it's, 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 it's several hundred miles, that's all, huh? between countries, that's all. See, but you know, the, anyway, so that's how come I say Bern, you know, a small town, you know, inside of uh, Switzerland. And that's how come they have four colonies because they're small. Too. But anyway, so that's the only time that I spoke Spanish. Yeah. And the rest of them were nothing in English, English, you know. Matter of fact, they never thought I was Spanish or Mexican, nothing. They thought I was an Italian at times. Like I tell you, I had a bunch of guys when I went to the cattery, when they made me sergeant to Oregon. Had a bunch of guys from a Niagara Falls, Buffalo, and Syracuse, and all that uh, up north in, uh, in New York. 
came out there, and we were not there. They came out there. They, they wouldn't know if I owned oil fields or cattle. They didn't know. They told everybody in Texas, you know. They told me I was from Texas, you know. And I uh, told them, no, I didn't uh, know nothing of that. And anyway, so they didn't know what a Mexican was. They said, I'm from Mexico. What's a Mexico? They didn't know, you know. And people, they didn't, how you call it? The, the, the world wasn't open to them like, the, like it is now, you know. In other words, uh, everybody was, uh, you read in books, that's it. And uh, anyway, so we got along pretty good, beautiful. And uh, like I say, they always thought I was telling all that. Matter of fact, one guy started talking and telling us. I understood a little, you know, because of Latin, you know. His name was, uh, he went to Paratrue with me. Uh, what the hell, Santa Rosa. Santa Rosa. You know. And talking like a, like a telling, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> whining all the time, you know. You know, he's a real nice guy. Did you pick up other languages while you were over there in, a, huh? in Europe? Did you pick up other languages? I picked up a little French, a little German. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you didn't practice, so you, you know. I, I used to converse a lot, you know, in, in English, I mean, in, uh, in French, in, in German. I stayed in Germany about three months, so I was, you know, learned the general over there. The only thing, the only thing is, you know, that uh, when we, had, we went to Berlin, we couldn't see nobody for three days. Everybody was inside. So, I said, Captain, I said, hey, Captain, I said, well, where's all the people? He said, I know we're not supposed to, you know, integrate or, you know, talk with the people and all that. He said, what's happened? He said, well, he said, there's a rumor going around that says that all the paratroopers in the United States had to kill their mothers to become a paratrooper, and they're afraid of us. As a as a rumor they, they spread, you know, say that paratroopers from the United States had to murder their mothers to, to become paratroopers. So everybody they they heard that we were, we were coming there, so everybody hid. You know, they started getting hungry, you know, because talking came out, we started eating, feeding them. So. But uh, you know, the propaganda it's all it is. And, uh, but otherwise, you know, I, I liked it, you know, I liked it to, to... Who started that rumor? Huh? Who started that rumor? They did. I mean, it's just, it's just propaganda, you know, like... like uh, uh, so they wouldn't, uh, you know, how you call it? Uh, Trend. Uh, yeah, Instead they, they wouldn't... Uh, they are very friendly, you know. That's, that's all. You know, but you know that's what they wanted. You know, people they wanted to they wanted people to think that you know we were barbarians. You know, that's all. But anyway, so after a while, you know, everything came out all right and everything, and then and people started coming out. And then uh, what happened is that uh, the the uh, what they call the red ball. Red ball express, they call it. Used to be truck drivers, used to carrying food supplies, you know, to the troops. They used to call them red ball express. They were nothing but colored people. They couldn't get them in the front line, see, so they put them in the truck drivers. They had all the food, so they started started making all that uh, with all the women out there. Yeah. So, so they had all uh, their pick out there, you know, the women out there. 
You know what? That, that, you know, that, you know, being a how you call it, young guys like us and all that thing. We didn't care. We, we, you know, we, we, we had our own conquest, anyways. But you know, but we didn't like it because of the fact that they start having the before we left there, they so heard that a lot of them were pregnant already with so damn colored people there. And that's only three months there, see. Well, anyways, uh, we we left there and uh, we left there on my birthday too. We left on November thirteenth, nineteen forty five. Forty four. Forty four. Let's see, forty four, forty five. Forty five, ninety four. Forty four, forty five. I don't know, get all mixed up, yeah. you know. Anyway, so, you know, I remember it was my birthday, you know. So we were outside and it starts snowing. Cam come at the same. Happy birthday, Gil. Oh, yeah, look at that. <laughs> it's snowing. <laughs> yeah, we were coming back. Too. How did um? That was in '45 because the fact that uh, I got discharged in '45. Yeah. But so when were you discharged? Huh? When were you discharged? When I was discharged? Yeah. Uh, this, uh, I think it was December. December 19th, I think. Yeah, December 19th. I said August, I said December. Okay, I can't read, can you? maybe you can. Should be in the bottom there. December 19, 1985. That's December 19th, because I got here in, in time for Christmas in Houston. Mm -hmm. December 19th. family doing? Huh? You, did your brother also go to, did your brother also serve in um, the military? The what? Your brother, was he also in the service? Yeah, he was in service too. He went in uh, Is it? 41, I think. Okay. Yeah. But you didn't, you weren't, you didn't see him well, all this time? Huh? All the time you were in service, you didn't have contact with him? We, we just wrote to each other, but we didn't see each other. No. Did you keep in touch with your family back home, to your parents? Huh? Did you keep in touch with your family back here in Houston? Yeah. By letters? Yeah, well, you know, like I say, we weren't too close to family, nothing okay. like that, but just sisters. Mm -hmm. The main thing, the main thing was that, you know, we worried more about our sisters and, mm -hmm. oh man, oh man, he get our money, good. Been there with women all the whole time. While you were in service, what was um, what did you do for fun? What did I do for fun? Were there fun times? Well, to tell you the truth, like I say, I'm not a party hall good nothing or whatever you call it. You know, no. I think we didn't we didn't uh, go to many dances or. No, like that. We just went downtown, have a good time, and probably have a few drinks, or mostly go out and eat and listen to the music, and that's it. You know, so we didn't, we didn't. Uh, like I said, we didn't. Uh, I wasn't a uh, how you call it a 
I didn't dance too much or still don't, you know, but you know, we didn't. And uh, we used to go to London out there and see those big bands and all that, you know, but we never danced there. They call it the Palladium out there. It used to be like that, you know, but, and uh, then the UFO, USOs and all that. Uh, but do. What we 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 when you used to go there just to you know, just to, to have a place to sleep at night time or you know, we 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 didn't uh, like I say, we were rowdy or nothing like that you know. Like especially with guys that I used to hang around with and all that. Matter of fact, one of them was a uh, was very religious. He was I tried to get him into the being a a priest, uh, assistant priest, you know. And uh, they didn't have no openings at that time because of the fact that there's a, they didn't have enough priests. Anyway, so this guy named Dance, D-E-N-T-Z, and uh, I think he got his pictures there. And uh, he always liked to hang around with me. And he's the kind of guy that you can even say damn from. You know, in the army, you, you know, you, you let your hair down a little, you know, right there, but he wouldn't even let, you know, he hanged around with me and I couldn't even do that. I couldn't even, you know, had to <laughs> walk a straight line on most of the time. So, that's, that's, that's uh, like I say, you know, as far as good times and all that, you know, we had a good time, but I, I don't say we, anything wrong or nothing like that. I could I remember, um, I in the Mojave Desert, right then, the, what's the name? Uh, what the heck is the name? Mojave Desert, uh, I know the name of the little town, I got a tip of my tongue. Anyways, we spent Christmas Eve there, and there was a guy, he was a busher. And I used to go out there and talk to him, you know, in Spanish, you know, once in a while, but a little old town anyway. Uh, and and uh, he said, come on over to the house for, for Christmas Eve, you know. It was so different from what we used to be, you know. You figure, you know, had tamales or, you know, something like that. They didn't have nothing, you know. How do you have to, they were gonna have a little dinner or something like that and had two girls and the girls had the boyfriends there and and they they weren't too friendly, you know. You know, the, the, how we say, yeah, got out of place, in other words, you know. I was out of place, you know. So, you know, I stayed there a while, and then I excused myself. You know, I went back to to uh, to uh, camp over there. You know, and they say, "Come on, Nigel, let's go." So where are we going? So we're gonna go tell uh, sing Christmas carols. Okay, so we went out there to drink. You know, went around a little town. You know, singing Christmas carols. That was our our Christmas deal. You know, but you know, the, the, I figure, you know. The, that guy invited me over there, tamales, you know, something like that. You know, been away from home and all well, nothing, man, I tell you. It's disappointment, that's all. <laughs> but eh, well, what the heck. You take, you take a lot of things like that, you know, and you expect too much, probably, I don't know. You, you expect the, the, like, I remember, we were going from uh, Oregon down to uh, to Fort Benton, Georgia. We caught a troop train, went down to uh, Boise, Idaho, Wyoming, then hit uh, Chicago. And they told us the troop train was gonna be there two days before we could go down to Georgia. So we stayed there. And we were in the 
YMCA there, got us a room there. They were not drinking. We went to a bar there. We didn't spend a penny. Hey, my boy's in the Navy. My boy's in the Army. Blah, blah. blah, blah, blah. Drink, drink all night long. We didn't even go to our rooms that night. Five o'clock in the morning, we're still drinking out there. You know, you didn't get drunk. You know, we were drinking all night long. We didn't get drunk. You know, you know they had what they call the bofanas. You know, the, you know, stuff like that. You know, little sandwiches and whatever. You know, and we kept eating all there. You know, so we never got drunk. You know. And anyway, so next day we we went out there to William Chain. And just to use our name, you know, we had that, so we could take a shower and all that. And then uh, sign off that night, say, okay. And then uh, we stayed there for three days. We couldn't get a troop train out of there. And uh, finally we got one out there and we went to, but all the time we were there, we wanted to get drunk or, or drink, we get to bar. Nobody, nobody let you buy drinks. My boy's in the service. My boy, blah, 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 blah. Oh, good, you know. So, you know, it's real nice, you know. The people are real friendly, you know. And then, uh, it's the first time that I've seen that a place that was open all night long, <laughs> Chicago. I say, don't they close here? Nope. Man, people just, Going to work, coming from work, blah, blah, all night long, you know. And uh, I was real surprised that, you know. Anyways, uh, we spent three days right there and three nights, and uh, it was real nice, and had a good time there. And then uh, went to Georgia, we got there a day late. He said, how come you late? He said, well, we couldn't find a transportation. At that time, you couldn't even get a Civilian place, there's nothing, you know. Had to get a troop train out there, and then the troop trains would take you about, take you about a day to go from here to Galveston, you know. And I'm telling you, we were slow. Anyway, so we got there, we got there a day late. <laughs> and then the, we got there to, uh, on the first, we couldn't get a, we couldn't get a, Train in there and the uh, bird troops. We could uh, go to town until after we got through tr 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 training, six weeks. We went to Birmingham, Alabama. They call it the Sin City. Alabama? They call it Sin City. Nothing but Prostitutes, <laughs> women, and all that. No kidding. That's why they call it Sin City. Gambling, anything you want there. Drinks, anything, you know. And they told us, they says, you go there, you go on your own. So you get picked up by the MPs, it's going to be your own. Little bud is going to be in there. And uh, we went there. Oh no, we turned right around and took off. <laughs> Too rough. Man, they, you get you get off of the bus there. The goddamn women bar, mobbed you. <laughs> Say no way, Jose. Let's get out of here. Man. I'm telling you. And then uh, from there on, uh, I remember you know. Oh yeah, they had the OTS. Uh, it's a officer's training school there, and uh, we heard that as soon as they come out, the first one that saluted you, you're supposed to get uh, that new new uh, officer to come out. The first one that saluted you, you're supposed to give him a dollar, you know. In other words, uh, so we used to stand out there, you know. We went out there, he could get about six dollars, you know. <laughs> six dollars was six dollars at that time, you know. Man, I tell you. Go out there to OCS and then go out there just to 
But you had to be at there real, you know, real quick, you know, because uh, when they when they graduate, you gotta be at there when they come out. You know, that's when you you go out there and start saluting. You know? That's when they start giving you dollars. <laughs> I'll tell you, sis. We had our times, you know. When did you meet your wife? Ma'am? When did you meet your wife? When did what? Did you meet your wife? Well, I came to Houston after I was discharged. I couldn't find a job, believe me. Everybody that had a job was because they were too old, they never went to service, and they they held on to a job, you know, like, you know, they wouldn't let nobody come to him, so. I took off for carpets. I found me a job there. I was there about a year, when, last year, when uh, me and a friend of ours, you know, said, uh, so if I wanted a date, I said, yeah, that's all right. You know, I didn't have no, they know nobody there, so. We double dated. That's how I met my wife, double date, you know. Who introduced her to you? Who introduced her to you? The what? Who was the one who introduced her to you? The who? Like, who introduced um, uh, her to you? Your friend? What year? No, your, what, your friend, like, you didn't know her. Your friend knew her, and he introduced you to her? I don't understand you. Um, she was your, a friend of your friend? No, what happened, see, this, uh, I was working in this store. She had a tailor. Yeah, he was a, t a salesman, and uh, a friend of his had a date with a, a girl. So this girl had two other girls, you know. He asked us if we wanted, uh, you know, blind date. So we went. He asked me, you know. So it was like a blind date, you know. So I was three. I was, you know, three couples, and uh, that's how we. Uh, my wife and I met, you know. So your wife is from Corpus? Yeah, well, a little town from Corpus, uh, Portland. Okay. A little town just before you get to Corpus. What is your wife's name? Uh, Ramirez. Her last name? No, her, uh, her full name. Huh? All her name. Antonia. Mm -hmm. Ramirez. And, uh... <coughs> Yeah, we were there in about, a, about a year and a half later, we got married. Were you already back in Houston, or were you still? No, we married there in a little town close by there, oh. Gregory, Texas, in uh, 1949. January 23rd. What was she doing at the time? Did you, was Ooh. she working? Your wife? She, she was working in the naval base there in Corpus Christi. And a what? Not naval base in the Corpus Christi. What did she do? And I was working at the S&Q clothing store. And what, what did she do? I, I was what, Taylor. Her, what did she do at the naval base? Uh, she worked in the A and R. They call it A and R. I don't know what it was. You know, they, uh, they fix wings and all that in the in the airplanes. And uh, then we got married. We come on Houston. Two weeks later, told her to go check out. She went out there and checked out. So we stayed in Houston. I didn't like Corpus. Mm. That was cutthroat over there. Every time I went to lunch, somebody go out there and offer their services for less than I was getting. And uh, besides that, you know, that I understand the, uh, well, I knew that the company was, you know, going down anyway, so. I came to Houston, but two years later they closed up the store. And what did you come do in Houston? Did you have a job already or no? Nothing. 
Og det her er næsten med uh, et bedroom, jeg tror. <laughs> jeg havde kolden, der tog t- t- uh, tre dage for et bedroom. Og der gav jeg den til Kirsten, der se, hvad der skete under. Når vi fik en service, min bror og jeg had bonds that we had sent money down to daddy and all that so he had a little money and uh we told him he says what the hell did he do with that money he didn't believe nothing or nothing don't own the car don't know our home or nothing see we made him buy a home he bought a home so when i got married i went out there and Rent, uh, stayed in the room with them, see. And after that, uh, about a year later, I moved up. Then I just bought a home, you know, and started that, and then started getting a bigger family, so I got a bigger home, see. And uh, that, uh, That where I'm at right now. But you know, like I say, we we had our struggles, you know, and all that because of the fact that uh, I was sending my kids through Catholic school and all that, you know, had to spend money, you know, and all that. For, uh, pay for the house, pay for her, for car, pay for, you know, this and that, and pay for the education and all that, so we're struggling. How many kids do you have? Huh? How many kids? Children? Four kids. Four? Two girls, two boys. Okay. So when you moved to Houston, how soon after did you um, become a firefighter? A big one? After, when you moved to Houston, How, um, what did you work in before becoming a firefighter or? Well, I was working in a tailor shop. Here in Houston? Yeah, here in Houston. Okay. I worked for uh, Kane Taylors and then I went to uh, Robert Hall. For Robert Hall, so I joined the fire department there. And then they, they hired me, you know, part time after getting out of the fire department, you know. When I was working in the fire department, I wouldn't work on them. Then I got a call from police to help them out, so I went and start working with them too. So I worked in two jobs for about 14 years. And uh, like I said, I never cared too much for money or for nothing like that, but you know, just to make ends meet, that's all. Um, you did not go back to school after coming back from the service? I was going to go back, but I went one minute. I went and registered at the University of Houston. So what do you want to go there for? Why don't you get your job? So that's, that's, that's a kind of a, how do you call it? Encouragement we we'll get, see? You know, just like I had a close to about $500 a little more left when I came out of the service. I was home and uh, got a letter. It says that they, they were selling lots out on, on Main Street, right across the street where uh, Playland, Playland used to be which is the same Houston, there used to be the same Houston uh, airport, I think it was. Anyway, they were selling lots. Fifty dollars in lot, they says, I could buy two of them. I had five hundred dollars. I told my woman, I said, I'm gonna buy a couple of lots. What do you want to do? That's not in the country, nothing. Six months later, they were making thirty-five thousand dollar homes over there. Six months later. $35,000 homes. You can imagine what $50 would have brought me. I could have sold one, and, you know, 
and build me a house, you know. But no, he had the kind of encouragement like that, see. So that dampened my, my spirits up. I never got the encouragements. So I said, it wasn't meant to be. That's it. So if they God wanted me to be have money or something like that, either, you know, let me have it or give me intelligent enough to go get it or something. Huh. So I'm satisfied. You said you send your kids to a Catholic school, a, a private school. My kids went to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they went to. Uh, they went to uh, elementary, and then uh, high school, and uh, they finished high school. They just went a couple of years to high school because they, uh, my two girls joined, uh, last two years they uh, went to St. Jacinto and finished high school there. And my two boys, uh, they quit also. One of them was going to St. Pius and the other one was going to, where was he going? You know, he going to high school too. And he went to Sam Houston, finished with high school there. But anyway, he was, my big girl, oldest girl rather, I sent her to the computer school. I went to the computer with thought coming out. She got a good job now. And uh Is that computer school here in Houston? Huh? Computer that computer Yeah, in Houston, yeah. Uh she started out with a shell. Then two years before she she had eighteen years and they fired her, you know, they cut down then she went to work in uh, Honeywell. And last year, they uh, cut down on her job too. And she got her another job uh, first of this year. So she's doing all right. And then the other one's a nurse. She's a uh, LVN. And then, uh, my, uh, Where did she study? Huh? Where did she go to school? She went to St. Justina and then she went to uh, Methodist Hospital to get her uh, LVN. Okay. And uh, my boy, he went to St. Houston, went to University of Houston. He's a uh, vice president of an uh, insurance company. In Phoenix, Arizona. What's his name? Leon Jr. And what is the your daughter's name? The one that went to the computer school. What's her name? Uh, the first one's Gloria. Okay. And the nurse? The next is Alice. Okay. And that's Leon Jr. One the two. And a Edward. He's an X-ray technician. He works at the uh, Veterans Hospital. So he's a technician? He's an extra technician. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and... And me, I'm a flunky. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead... Be one. Your wife? My wife, you... she never worked. She's a housewife. Um, could you tell me about um, the things you were involved with after the war? Like you told me you were in the huh? Um Organizations that you were involved with after the war? Like you told me. Well, uh, Lulex. I was a. Uh, I was here with Lulex. Huh? What year did you get involved with Lulex? 
Uh, we're in the 50s, 1950s, somewhere in there. And then, uh, I think it was about 56 when I quit, anyway. Then about 1963, I joined the uh, Knight of Columbus. And uh, then also, about four years later, I quit from them. Then, uh, 1983, I reinstated myself into Knight of Columbus. And I've been active ever since. I belong to the, uh, I'm a life member of the uh, Veterans of Four Wars, 581. And you're still an active member, right? Mm -hmm. I've been a member of the church council in the St. Patrick's Church, Eucharistic minister. Been uh, what else I've done? Cut a finance uh, okay. program to or whatever kind of money. Mm -hmm. Oh, with your church. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, that's about it. You know, that's a. Uh, I haven't been too active, with, you know, while I work and all that because the fact that we're making a living, and since then, you know, I've been doing a little. That's retired, that's all. Can you tell me about your um, your experiences your, of being a firefighter? Firefighter? Mm -hmm. How many years were you? Well, that's one job I like. I really enjoy it. Firefighting was a second nature to me, you might say, you know. Remind me a lot of uh, the military, that's why I guess, you know. And uh, I've had uh, my experiences, you know, in big fires and all that and all that, but I never did uh, have the, uh, let me say, opportunity or the, uh, the chance to go ahead and uh, become a hero or anything like that because of the fact that, you know, the circumstance never prevented, uh, presented itself while I was there. You know, but uh, I did my job, that's the main thing. I loved it and I used to drive trucks and pumpers, you know, and uh, I loved that. And the only thing that uh, I regret is that uh, that siren was right there, sitting right in front of me, and sort of penetrating my uh, eardrums. And you got a little hard of hearing because of that. But I'm glad, uh, you know, that I've I become one because of the fact that uh, I've got a good pension and all that, you know, so it gives me a, some kind of liberty, you know, as far as uh, financial problems of concern, you know. How many years were you a firefighter? Five, uh, 20 years. And then you went to Europe with your wife. Huh? And then you went to Europe with your wife. By uh, what? You went to Europe with your wife after um, retirement from... Yeah. Yeah. When I retired, I, I didn't want to do nothing, but, you know, I don't say I'm a pay the couch or nothing like that, but, uh, you know, I do some, like to keep active and all that and run the house, but I don't, uh, 
I never tried to, to get back in the red race, you know. You know, try and get big money and that. I don't think it was, uh, see after I retired from the fire department, I was 55 years old. I went to work in the store as a manager. After you retired? Yes, for seven years. I was a manager of a clothing store, a big man store, you know, for big people. What's the store called? Uh, it was Bucks Man, Big oh, okay. Bucks Big Man Store. They call it. And uh, I was telling my wife, I said, uh, according to my calculations, I'm working two days for for the government, three days for myself. I said, I'm just spinning my wheels. I'm going to retire. So I did. All I did was put myself in a hard bracket and paint the government, that's all. So I retired. I mean, the hustle and bustle and uh, everything, you know, that goes with the red race, you know. Getting up and blah, blah, be sure to be there and putting up with the, with the public and whatever, you know, and it wasn't worth it to me. I feel better. I go to the doctor and he says, how old are you? I said, I'm 80. Said, You're 80? You don't look like 80. I said, I don't feel like 80. Thank God I don't, you know. I said, why? Hey, that pressure has a lot to do with it. I'm relaxed. I'm, I'm doing what I want. I do what I want when I want to. So. And that, that, that has a lot to do with, the, with your living, you know. I'm not, I don't know no, no uh, young punk or nothing like that, you know, but at the same time, you know, I'm not, I don't say I got a foot in the grave already, you know, because thank God I feel good. I just got over uh, having a flu. Matter of fact, this is the first time I've been out in three weeks. Why? Because of the fact that you got to take care of yourself. No, you, t I don't know. People, people, you know, always uh, complain about this and complain about that. Says, I don't complain. I just take things just to come. If I'm sick, I'll bear with it. If I don't, well, thank God, you know. I'm just a different kind of person, that's all. <laughs> How did the war change your life? Huh? How did the war change your life? Well, to tell you the truth, it helped me a lot. For simple reason, I never have left Houston, you might say. All my life. Oh, you know, I've been to Galveston, something like that, you know, but, you know, like I say, you know, travel and nothing like that. I never knew the world. I started meeting different people from different states. I found out there were uh, different cultures. I found out that uh, there's more the own lifestyle than 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 uh, you know I would call it people I would call it, the way I see it the way I see it. Yes, people at that time, we didn't have no radio, we didn't have no television, we didn't have no telephones, we didn't have the convenience that we have today, and we had to go out in the world and open our eyes. That's how it, how it affected me. It opened my eyes, gave me experience 
to travel, to meet people, to meet uh, different cultures, find out what suffering is about. In other words, when you suffer, you find out what uh, life is about. You, you find out that, uh, that the more you sacrifice, the more you appreciate things. It's like if you own a home, you go out there and pay somebody to, to paint your house. You don't feel nothing, you know. But if you go out there and you, you sweat and you, you paint your house and all that, you're doing something, you appreciate something, see? You're sacrificing something so you can appreciate it more, see? Because it look better, because you paint. That's what I'm talking about, see? That's what I'm talking about. You know, uh, how you call it? Uh, the sacrifices that you do, you appreciate more then somebody hand it to you in a, in a platter. In other words, what I work for from a pension, I appreciate more than if somebody, the government, like say the government come and they say, here, 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 here's your, your check every month. That's the way I feel. That's the way I, uh, the army uh, uh, taught me, you know. Don't take nothing for granted. If you're going to do something, it's going to cost you. That's it. And that, uh, what, uh, how you call it? One thing about it is, uh, you take a, a person that never been out of the, that never been out of the, state or something like that, see. They don't know what they're missing. They're just like me. I took my wife to Europe. She never been out of states, out of Texas. When I took her out there, well, we've been to Mexico and all that, you know, but we took her down there. She seen what an old, the old country was about, you know, how they live. The different styles, the different uh, ways, uh, how you call it, the, uh, the people don't be depend, in, in uh, Europe don't depend so much on monetary stuff like they do in the United States. They're not capitalists. United States, they want everything. You, you got money. If you don't have money, they got the TVs there. They got credit cards, they got the... In Europe, they don't. Either you got money, you don't. And you learn to, to live, to be po uh, 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 poor poverty, was poverty, see. And you are accepted because of the way you life. In the United States, if you're poor, what do they do? Complain to the government. Government, come and help me. And all that. Europe, they don't do that. You either you got it or you don't. Government ain't, don't care for you. And that's what, what I'm talking about, the opening your eyes about the world. You open your eyes to the world because of the fact that the way the people live, not, not the way we live here in the United States. You can go to Houston right here. I can show you different, five different ways that people live. From poverty, some that are sick, don't have them, can't, can't afford no, no medical system. People that are well off, middle class, something like that. And some people that are rich and all that. And some people that, whatever, see. But you can, different kind of people, see. All because of one, one, one little town.
Little Teddy. But look at the woman with herself, see? Look at the woman. They were not talking about the army. It opens your eyes up, but the way people live, not only here, but in every country. In Europe, you get, in Europe you get X amount in different countries. And all of them, either dictators or, or some kind of uh, government, say. That is capitalist. Look at England. How long has England been under a king? As long as I can remember, they've been under some sovereign of the, some king. Eh? And do they change? No, they, they won't change, but they won't. You think, they've got to look at Arabs right there. That's all, you know. Everybody got their own style, their own beliefs, their own uh, way of thinking, all that. And what I'm talking about, change your life by opening your eyes, by feeling what the world's about. Not, 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 you know, not what we're sending right here, you know, to explain everything. No. There's, there's more to, to life than that. It depends what you want to, what, what, what do you want to absorb? You want to absorb part of life the way it is, or you want to just take as, as it comes, say, or, the, or take the path that you, more lenient for you. And to me, Like I say, tomorrow is another day, but I live it today like if it's tomorrow. Because of the fact that I have faith. When you have faith, you get, you'll see tomorrow. Hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, I have one final question for you. Do you think that Latinos have, have come a long way. Who? Latinos. Yes and no. Latinos have come a long ways, but not as much as we, we should have. For a simple reason, like I said, around 1955 or 54, somewhere in there, that when the, you, we broke the barriers. And they haven't progressed too much because of the fact that Latinos are not united. They're not a, they got too much prejudice against each other. There's too much dream fighting. They're not like the colored people. Colored people don't get done who it is. As long as you're black, you can get in there. See? And Latinos are not like that. No. Hey, I'm the boss right here. This is the patron. I control so many votes. No, you 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 cannot run because you, you don't have the backing up of the the barrio or this or that. That isn't that. See, that's that what I'm talking about. They they don't they, they're not gonna get no war and think of infighting. All that infighting. What I think they will. To get ahead is to cooperate. Get somebody in there, and let's let's get him in there. Not not because he wants to be a patron or or a boss or whatever you call him. See, let's get him in there. Let's. Why have you read the paper this morning? Tony Sanchez. On Brown. Oh, on Brown. They killed it. That ninety million dollar loan that they wanted on that deal, on that housing project, right? You hear what the councilman says? Brown told him, "If you don't go vote for him, he says you ain't gonna be backing up by the black people." See what I'm talking about? Politics. That's like I'm not liking. He threatened them. A black vote. And where does he get the black votes? Where? Churches. 
and that's supposed to be a separation of church and state, right? What the heck is he doing out there partaking in churches? Why don't they say something about it, huh? Being colored? No, it's all right. But like I say, Latinos are never going to get uh, get ahead because of the fact that they they infighting. Too much infighting instead of helping each other. And say, hey, wait, you help me, I'll help you. You know, some of that. They try like uh, Sanchez right now and Morales. Yeah, okay, let me. I'm going to back you up. I'll make you a lieutenant government. You know, I'll back you up for a lieutenant government. Something like that. You know, always back them up. Show, show, show them to support. But they don't show support. The big win. Mucha envidia. The Americano, mucha envidia. I don't, I don't go for that. And then, as long as there's envidia, you're not going to find nothing. Only, the only thing I see is people that are going to get up there, Latinos are going to get up there, as they say, follow the to tailcoats of the winners, like Republicans. We don't care whether they're Republicans or uh, Democrats. We want Latinos in there. What's different with the whether you can vote uh, for Social Security, you can vote for Medicaid or what? See? You're going to get in there, you can vote for what they want you to. Not, not what you want to. Whether you're Democrat or Republican or Independent or what? Politics is a... Uh, <laughs> that's what I think about it. Are there any future plans to travel? I always want to travel. I always want to travel. If I had the money, I'd go to Puerto Rico. I've been wanting to go to Puerto Rico. I don't know why, but I want to go. If I had a couple of thousand dollars to spare, I'd go over there. No kidding. But it is. Uh, I'll just take a run here in the States. <laughs> Probably go to Las Vegas or Reno or so. <laughs> <coughs> well, Maggie wanted um, you to show uh, stuff. What? Maggie said that she wanted you to. Uh, this one? Stuff that you had in the back, I think. This one? Yeah, she said that you had What's that? This one here? Could you just explain what that is? It's more like a bayonet for parades. As for a parade, it's a bayonet, you know, for the, they use it for uh, the Nazis, you know, when they parade and all that. It's, it's, not, a, it's not like a bayonet or nothing like that. It's more like a dagger, that's all it is. See. And uh, this, uh, this also just uh, just for the, uh, she's got the eagle head in and all that. It's, uh, it's a dagger also, that just for parade. And also to have the, uh, this one here, that's uh, all for Dutchland, it says there. All for the Dutchland. It's uh, also for parade, you know. The most of this are uh, the uh, and this is con this is a regular bayonet. That's a uh, they say it was a Swiss. See, it's got a got four edges on it. See, it's got four edges on it. No, see. It's a bayonet, and uh, 
Yeah. And you've got this left bayonet right here, too. That's also a bayonet for the... They use that for a... Most of them, they used to rush in the league right there. Mm -hmm. Just for that. And then I have a... I have a swastika plate. Oh, okay. Yeah. This, uh... We got in a rural rally there. We went to the building and I went in there and it was hanging out there. Went out there to the balcony and I got it. No. Where did you say you got it? I got this in the rural rally out there in Essen, Germany. It was out there in the building. And uh, I got it at, uh, at that time, you don't think nothing too much, you know, just, you just wanted some, something, you know, to be near, and that's what I got it, sent it home. And uh, then I got some uh, old uh, medals, some of them from, uh, World War Two, uh, World War One, and uh, there, uh, see, like this one here. There's 1939. Okay. And this is a uh, cross, uh, eight, uh, Iron Cross, 1813. And this. Uh, 1914, this is World War II, 14 to 18. <coughs> and this one right here is uh, also World War II, 1914 18. And this one here is uh, I think it's uh, from the 1938, I think this from the, the Olympics out there. So, 1938 in Germany. And this is another one, last one is uh, this also a medal right there, don't have no date on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a, it's a buckle from the, one of the belts there. That's a German buckle. And that's, uh, that's about it, all I have. Except the, uh, I had more, I don't know what happened. I had a, I got a, I got a saber, big old saber like that. You, I don't want to bring it. It was too long. It's about that big. That's a nice one. Huh? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Regia. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Do you have something, um, final words to say? Well, not necessarily. Uh, right now, the only thing is that uh, I hope it. Uh, Help you a lot, a little anyway. So it's uh, more like a this is the most I ever talked about anything like that since I've gone back. Tell you the truth. So the thing is, uh, something about it you put you at ease. You can tell, talk about it, and all that. See, that's not like uh, somebody prying into your life or something like that. In other words, all they do not asking, and, you know. Like you said, if you want to answer, okay. If not, well, it's up to you. But I think the best thing for uh, for something like this is that uh, we. Uh, 
we hope that the Latinos will wake up. You know, when uh, came out of the service, they said that there were 26 Medal of Honors here in the United States. And 12 of them were Mexicanos. 12 out of 26. Can you imagine that? Almost half of them. You think you're not proud? Thank you, Mr. Thank you for sharing huh? your experiences. Thank you for sharing. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> some people have experienced them, but like I say, uh, I just hope somebody gets something out of it. That's the main thing. I know uh, I haven't contributed too much, but what little I did, I hope it helped somebody. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, she took some pictures uh, that she